A director is truly the blend of vision and execution. An artist who needs the ability to navigate not only the production side of things, but the business side of things as well. And today to discuss this topic is none other than one of the top directors, Mike Ray. A director born in Belleville and now based in Toronto, Mike's name is in the hat of some of the biggest commercial gigs in the industry. With a resume that expands from Microsoft, Canadian Tire, Toronto Blue Jays, and the NBA, he has seen it all. And today he shares with us his insights on what it truly takes to become a successful director. So, welcome to the Apple Box Podcast. My name is Danny Lau, and I'm alongside my co-host, Anthony Valtinas. And sitting across of us today is none other than Mike Ray. Let's get it. So, welcome to the Apple Box Podcast. Today, we have with us Mike Ray, who is a director here in Toronto, um, does really big stuff and really cool stuff. And you guys check out his Instagram, MikeRay.tv, I believe it is. Yep. Um, you can see just the work speaks for itself. Um, personally, I, as a DP, I look at your stuff, I'm like, God damn well, that looks good <laughs> but i also appreciate also your pacing and how you your you, just the, the way that your your videos they pace themselves and that's a director yeah you know and, you. and the vision right and so you know i definitely have a lot of respect for you um i know anthony's a big fan of yours as well <laughs> he reached out to you it's like we're fanboying a little bit <laughs> <laughs> no you know you gotta hype up the guests um yeah. you know that, that doesn't take much hyping up um but yeah. you know we're gonna start off obviously by talking about who you are and we're going to eventually get into the industry and coming from someone uh, who's well-established in the industry. So who's Mike Ray? That's a great question. <laughs> I'm still figuring it out. Yeah. We're, we're always evolving. I don't know. I don't think there's any like pinpoint on, you know, who you are, where you're going kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I started in the industry. I wouldn't say the industry, but probably s- sooner than most people did you know i was first generation gopro came out and you know i had a paper route when i was 12 13 and my parents tried to convince me not to buy it and i ended up buying it and now we're here that's crazy i started from a gopro and how old were you when you got the go when you got the gopro oh i must have been 14 yeah 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 Wow, but, uh, it served its purpose, you know. It's, <laughs> just, did you film the paper route like as you were going through it? Yeah, and <laughs> yeah. time lapse it. Yes, <laughs> I had a little electric scooter as well that I used to rip around. That's uh, <laughs> until it was so wow. efficient. Just, did you was it in <laughs> did you grow up in Toronto or was it in a smaller town or yeah, a smaller town, Belleville? So, oh, uh, Belleville, okay. yeah, I was always like a sports guy growing up, and then, um, I don't know, something something flipped when I was like grade 10, grade 11, and you know, kind of gravitated gravitated towards the arts a little bit more. And nice. then, uh, yeah, I mean, there wasn't much of it back in Belleville. So moved to Toronto, obviously, to, you know, go to school and all those things. And, yeah. you know, that's obviously a longer story. But yeah. Yeah. Which school did you go to? Um, it was Humber College. Oh, Humber. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. right. Humber College in Lakeshore, right? I remember yeah. we talked about it Yeah, last Lakeshore time. Campus. Yeah. It's yeah, the, yeah. Uh, it's a bachelor degree or something. Yeah, yeah, that's where I went for for acting. Yeah, I thought I wanted to be an actor. Did, did you have any friction like with like your parents or anything like going to film school or like taking film or? Um, no, I would say there was friction, you know, to the idea of getting like an education. Okay, right. you know, they're very keen on getting an education, and oh, you know, yeah. obviously the the route that I took and not finishing school was a bit of a damper on things, but um. Yeah, it played out in the end, and I guess yeah. it worked out at yeah. the end of the day. Yeah. Like so. Yeah. And how did you find like in terms of film school? What was your experience like? Some people hate it. Some people thought it was a waste of time. Some people love it. Yeah, I'm a huge advocate against film school now. Yeah. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure other schools are are different, but it I guess it comes down to the teachers and Humber. Humber specifically was said to have industry professionals and that just wasn't the case and Mm. you know it's sad to see a lot of teachers that are just you know burnt out individuals and in the industry and obviously they take up teaching as you know a form of form of uh kind of just staying in the industry in a way and still being part of it yeah that and money obviously yeah you know you got to make a living you got to survive if you're not good at film you know yeah yeah (laughs) <laughs> not in every case it's, yeah it's yeah it's, it's, it's a, there's a pattern there though especially in terms of like i need consistent yeah. work this is like a consistent 
yeah. easier like job, yeah. I guess. You just yeah. talk. Yeah, I mean, there was teachers in the in the program that uh, they finished the program in the year after they they started teaching the program, and oh. you wow. know, that just shouldn't, right into it. that yeah, shouldn't happen like it that. It just shouldn't be yeah. the case. But you know, it, I hear that pretty famously yeah. throughout most film schools, and mm-hmm. I'm not going to list names because yeah. I can't. I don't, I've never been to any, so I don't want to talk exactly, bad about yeah. any of them. But yeah. like, I hear that all the time. Like students mm-hmm. are like, "Oh yeah, you know, this is." I feel like the four years they spend in film school were better off four years on set. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can take that money and put it like straight into spec, right? And yeah. A lot of people <laughs> yeah. also say like, you know, the best thing that they got out of film school is meeting other people, and you know, I'd like to say that that's the case as well but there's probably you know one or two other people that i met in film school that i'm still you know chatting with and you know obviously my one good buddy kenny um we we've worked together a lot but you know other than that it still wasn't really the case you know i guess i was kind of already into film and a lot of these people were showing up and going into the program that had never picked up a camera and they thought that they wanted to make the next star wars when right. you know in reality <laughs> star wars too. Yeah. it's not as easy as just going to film school and you know making yeah. movies yeah. yeah yeah and they don't really teach you like the onset experience no and that's that's the thing and that's something that i've been trying to do on every set that i have now it's you know not every job that i have is you know the biggest one in the city but you know there's a chance that's bigger than something that someone else has done in the past so yeah. i try to bring out you know, a shadow or someone on set every time that I, that I have a job. Um, just because, you know, a lot of people aren't given those opportunities and yeah, you know, I think a lot of it is looked at as like a closed door industry with a lot of secrets and Mm. the secret really is that there is no secret, you know, you just got to go out and do it. Yeah. 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 That's true. That's, that's facts. Like I, I, I respect that a lot because Mm. Even for me, like I do the same thing. I don't do the stuff at your level. Obviously, we're working towards mm-hmm. that and we want to get mm-hmm. there. But even at my, I guess you can call it low mid tier level or high low tier mid- level, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. like, you know, bringing people who want to be part of it, who, who yeah. are like completely green straight out of film school. Yeah. I feel like giving back and, and showing them like this is where the value is at. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, like when I was in high school, I remember this, this, one guy specifically, I was on in vacation in like Mexico and they were shooting an ad, I think, for the for the hotel. Yeah. And I ended up getting the guy's contact and you know, I was emailing the guy email after email, trying to convince him to let me come on set, you know, back yeah. in like high school already yeah. and I hadn't even been to film school yet. So it's just and I think there is a gap there. Um some type of program or some type of shadowing network that yeah. you know you can inspire those younger people that yeah would never be allowed to come out on set but everybody looks at it as like a liability bringing someone on set because it can be right i mean you're responsible for you're that responsible for and, their and, behavior yeah. exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah but we're working on something that you know maybe can change that one day nice oh yeah. nice are you allowed to talk a little bit more about it or it's more that's like that's enough I think no, a little bit of a tease. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah that's yeah. pretty cool i like it though i respect that initiative a yeah lot. yeah it's funny because when I, I i was early like early on i was working at a company like doing videography and photography mm. maybe for like a year or two and i was riding my bike in the winter for some reason and they were shooting this like winter cr- uh, movie yeah this like hallmark movie like in uh like near my house yeah so i just pulled up and i was just watching for like an hour and the, and the grips were like, it's like a union job. They're like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm just watching. Yeah. I like, really like this. I'm like going to film school. Like, he's like, like, you enjoy this? Like, we're, we hate our lives. No. And uh, <laughs> but eventually, but eventually like, after like two hours, they're like, like, yeah, like we can try to get you into the union. Like we can help you help you out. Like you seem interested in this. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, it'd be great. And then I had a few connections from there. It's pretty. Mm-hmm. So I think even like it goes back to your story about the hotel. Like just I think if you have that kind of. Um, that desire to do it, yeah. you'll kind of, you'll, you'll make your way through. Yeah, you'll find a way. Yeah. Like yeah. you worked for a production company before you branched yeah. off to your own thing. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, to go back a little bit and like talk about school. Um, yeah. You know, I ended up having a hard time with this one teacher and uh, ended up not finishing school. And then from there, I pretty much went straight to working at, at a production company full time and started. Uh, started out as like an assistant editor and i think within Mm. probably four or five months um i started directing all their stuff yeah um so yeah at like 21 years old or something i mean it was a small production company there was eight or nine people 
but um yeah i mean what was like the level of production would you say um during that um, time i mean budget wise it was yeah. probably like jobs anywhere between like 40 to like 150 like 180 kind of okay. deal so yeah. i mean not like the biggest stuff in the world um obviously you know commercial budgets on a bigger scale go like for a day for 180 right but um yeah i mean it was it's exposure that you got to do and work through i guess so how did you even mm -hmm. initially go from assistant editor to directing something even at forty thousand mm -hmm. dollars like how did you make that leap into um, taking that position i wouldn't say it's by accident i think the initiative was there when i started the company and they there was this one travel job that nobody wanted to go on because it was in, you know, interior America and just mm -hmm. like weird travel days. It was like fly in for a day, fly out kind of deal. So it was like one day of shooting. Nobody wanted to do it. Yeah. Um, so they're like, oh, I'll just give it to Mike. And uh, <laughs> it, it turned out pretty decent. So, uh, yeah, I guess from there they're like, okay, we'll give you another one of those. And then, wow, you know, yeah. like a, was it like a salaried position at the time for you there. Yeah, yeah, it was salary position. It was wow. very, very low salary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's yeah. something you got to work through, yeah. And you were 21 yeah. when you started? or Yeah, I want to say 21, probably until I was 23 or 24. I was there for probably three years. Wow, yeah. wow. so you gathered yeah. a lot of experience in those three years. Yeah. And would you say that like that translated directly once you went off on your own? Would you say that the skill sets you learned from there kind of translate directly to what you did um or would you have to make another like leap in in terms of skill or in terms of technical knowledge i don't think in terms of skill i think in terms of freedom um mm. because we were all internal at a company there was much less leverage uh to make creative decisions and kind of mm. work outside of the box because we were working on retainer with companies and um it was a lot of repeat business. Right. So, you know, once these companies had their branding, it was, you know, kind of same. stuck right to it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it was a lot of repetitive stuff. And I think if anything, what I learned from that was just, you know, how to work under pressure. Like the hours that we were working were crazy. It was, right. you know, like there's no such thing as 40 hours. We'd be in the office until, you know, 11 at night, finishing up a job or dumping wow. cards and then be back in the office at like, you know, 7 a.m. kind of deal. Yeah. Or wow. flying out the next day and then shooting for a day and then flying back kind of deal. Nonstop. Yeah. So it was, yeah, it was kind of like that inevitable grind. A lot of 60 hours. Yeah. 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 Probably even more than 60. Yeah. 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 At least 70, probably. Yeah. yeah. So what did that freedom do for you? I guess it just kind of opened up your creative mind and you just decided, hey, like stepping out of. Yeah. Stepping the, out of that production company. What was your, like, your next step? Um, I mean, it's definitely making a voice for yourself, mm. you know, being a director, I guess, um, looking long term is if somebody sees one of your projects, you want them to kind of be reminded of who made it, right? You want to make your own right. style. So like, that definitely helped once I stepped out of that full time uh, position. But, you know, you obviously don't go straight into that, that, you know, I guess your own personal branding or your style like it, it evolves obviously over years yeah so you know coming out of that production company i went freelance for the for the first time i think this is like a year and a half two years before covid mm -hmm. and you know i was searching places to get signed you know that idea of getting signed which yeah. really isn't that big of a deal but you know everybody has this you know interpretation that being signed is like you know you kind of made it sort of deal yeah um so yeah i just worked freelance for like a year or two and it was mostly editing kind of kind of gigs yeah um and then working through passion projects and doing spec and those other things and kind of figuring out your style and what kind of jobs you want to do because mm -hmm. you know those specs that you make are ultimately what's going to win you the job when it does come when the money does come it's Interesting. Yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit about on that spec because I know mm -hmm. there's a lot of like, I guess you can say controversy with specs. Some people might mm -hmm. say, "Don't fund it yourself. Get someone else to fund it." Other people might be like, "You know what? We're just gonna fund it." Like me and Andrew yeah. decided we're just gonna fund it. What do you think is the best approach for specs? And and let's talk a little bit about the importance of it. Yeah, I think spec really depends on what you want to get out of it. Um, if somebody's funding your spec, 
it's it's really it's not completely yours and at the end of the day someone else has a bit of a say in it right right yeah if you're funding it yourself you have complete freedom to do whatever you want and you can speak your style without any any hand holding yeah. um high risk high reward yeah so i think if you're a signed director at a production company then yes like your production company should you know give you some money or some some leverage to expand on your style mm-hmm. um but like i said then you're you're tied to that company and they have part ownership and 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 say in what you're doing yeah. um so i think to start it's probably best to fund yourself you know and it doesn't yeah. take that much money really it just you know takes a couple of homies and a camera to go and make something right yeah. you know Talent there's passion. yeah projects that you know me and my best buddy kenny mclaughlin have made you know and stuff that i think still holds value like we've pulled off for a couple hundred bucks it, wow. it really you know money isn't that big of a factor i guess a lot of it comes down to location and production value but right you know if you work hard enough and you know go through loopholes you can find those things without the money yeah, yeah. that's yeah. fascinating so how many spec mm-hmm. projects have you have you done that you say are like still valuable to this day um i mean like i'm working on a spec right now too right like i think oh, you know sick. part of you, evolve, you know you keep evolving in this yeah keep evolving i guess part of you know getting stale in the industry is getting too comfortable and stopping to making those things that you really want to make um mm. but i guess specs that have hold, like held up there's probably two or three of them that are still you know viable i guess yeah yeah wow but um yeah like i mean you know longevity in your career i think comes from like a narrative sense or or a style you know people are buying into you and they're not buying into that niche that you've you know pigeonholed yourself into not necessarily a product it's the style exactly yeah Yeah, exactly there's people that direct for products let's say cars for example and then i think there's people that can direct to like narrative and storytelling yeah i think that's what's important and especially in terms of longevity in your career right yeah you know look 20 years down the road you know, those car commercials, those car specs that you did, like that style of that type of commercial is going to keep evolving, right? So yeah. once that style that you've created in that niche changes, then you're kind of shit out then of luck. Then you're obsolete in a lot of ways. You exactly. You have to readapt. Exactly, yeah. 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 So then you got to go back and you got to reevaluate the style and, and you're known for that style now, right? It's so fascinating. you have to reinvent that. Because I feel like that's like from a like you know what you're talking about about being pigeonholed and being niched into one thing you mm-hmm. would think that only comes from client and and someone who doesn't understand the technical or the creative aspect of things mm-hmm. and i could see where they're coming from and how they might see it that way yeah i'm kind of shocked to hear that you would even hear from that from dps or hear that from creatives because as mm-hmm. creatives i almost feel like you know that what you create doesn't really matter what's in front of the camera. Everyone just has a style. Your storytelling is what your mind, yeah. not what's in front of the camera yeah. is what matters. Yeah. It's definitely a hard thing to do and it really comes down to communication. It's not necessarily about fighting back and saying no, but it's about communicating things and style and creative in a way that people can understand and lead them to where you want them to go. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I always say that directing is, you know, 50 percent planning and 50 percent communication yes realistically yeah Yeah. um you know you can talk anyone into something Mm -hmm. if you talk to them the right way yeah right i guess that's the the business side of things that outside of the creative that you need to have and you build that trust like if they trust your vision and they trust you as a person then Mm -hmm. they'll you'll probably likely guide them into into trusting what you want for that project exactly so like yeah fighting back with them or maybe they're anxious or nervous because they have those money on the line obviously so exactly yeah yeah when you talk about trust and money that's you know we were talking about this earlier but that evolution of kind of like budget ranges and other things and really the only thing that comes down to is trust brands yes. trusting you eps trusting you mm. your dp trusting you you know that's a lot of the time you know, the creative on a couple hundred dollars could be better than something on, you know, a $200,000 day. Right. But what it comes down to is, does that company, do these EPs, these agency producers, do they trust you with that money not to fuck it up? 
a lot of people aren't willing to take risk. And I guess, you know, that comes back to how you shape, you know, who you are and what your style is. is yeah. You want to be that guy that they come to to mm-hmm. want to take the risk because mm-hmm. they know that you've taken risk before and you've executed. And yeah. I think that this kind of goes full, full circle back to specs, right? Being able to prove that you are one, willing to invest in yourself. Yeah. And two, that you're proving proof of concept that you can do what you're talking about. Yeah. So in a lot of ways, like you said, no matter how much of a salesman you are, you can't get a car commercial without car material. So you got to go and get yourself. Yeah. If no one's going to trust you, trust yourself and go and do it. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like proof Proof is in the pudding. Yeah. And if you don't trust yourself, how can you expect anyone to trust you too? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. A lot of it's, yeah, the evolution of, you know, learning to trust yourself and your decision making. And, yeah, you know, that's obviously a big thing for a lot of new directors as well. So speaking on the process of like working with an agency on a high level, mm-hmm. when you're working with six high six figure budgets, how much of the concepts and the ideas come from you and how much of it comes from the agency? Is it already predetermined when it comes to you? And I, I understand it, but in either scenario, it can happen, but mm-hmm. on a, on a ratio level, like how often do you get to create the story and the concept and how often is it given to you? I think it, there's a couple factors. It depends on who you are, how much they trust you, obviously. Um, but it depends on the client and who the creative team is, right? Um, I've seen boards where people have an Excel sheet and they have a couple of sentences written down. They don't have the creative fleshed out. But then, you know, a lot of the boards from agencies you see will be a deck of, you know, 20, 30 pages with everything broken down. Yeah. Which is fantastic, but it gives you a little bit less room to, you know, kind of work your magic. But... Um, at the end of the day, once you know, once you go through shortlist and you you come to your director's pitch with the agency is, you know, a lot of the time there's two types of agency people that you're pitching to. There's people that you want you to pitch something that is unique to your style, and that's why you're there to pitch on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then there's also a pitch where they just want you to regurgitate everything that's in the boards to tell them you know how to pull this job off right interesting yeah right. and so when further down the pipeline you mm-hmm. find your dp how much does the dp play a role in terms of the creative and the concept um, for those type of projects there's a couple of different avenues in this too and depends on the size of the job and what the job is um you know let's say i'm pitching on a car commercial and i don't have car material yeah you know there could be an instance where we approach the agency and tie my name to a DP that has shot tons of car, yeah. you know, just to give them a little extra push right. of, you know, let's say this director is good in this visual type of storytelling, but the DP has done car commercials time and time again. So a yeah, little bit of extra, you know, push for them or persuasion, so to say. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So in that case, DP would have more say in the creative then because... Yeah, the DP would have more say in the creative. It, it, like, it comes back down to trust, right? Right. Um, but yeah, for the most part, like, there will be an approval process for for choosing your DP with the agency. You'll propose a couple people, um, but it's a collaborative effort. Yeah. You know, obviously, as a director, you want the style to match what the job is going to be, mm-hmm. um, but you also want them to be sellable to the agency as well, right? Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. It's, when it comes to like you, I remember we spoke about this before and just like the process of like, um, you know, getting your job from the agency because you're repped. We'll just establish that right off the bat. You're mm-hmm. repped. I guess there was like a process that happens in terms of how you are vetted from agencies. Maybe we talk a little bit about how agencies find directors and how did you get on their radar? How do you get on their radar for projects that you want to do? Yeah, I mean, I guess the way that I've found the industry is working right now is like agencies usually don't have much direct contact with the directors. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what the production companies are there for and the EPs. So the EPs are the ones that have the relationships with the agency producers and and people internal that hold the accounts for all these brands. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, usually what the agencies do is they'll make these set of boards, they'll send it off to 20, 30 production companies, and then everyone will kind of respond with the director on their roster that they think is most appropriate for that job, yeah. you know, make sure the style fits. And then from there, once they have everyone's reels, 
of these 20, 30 directors, uh, they'll shortlist. So they'll pick three people. Those three directors will go ahead and they'll make their own treatment interpretation of what the job is, what the mm-hmm. style should be, maybe their own bit of narrative twist on it. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, you go through this grueling hour, hour and a half long pitch with the agency where they just stare at you and say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and then from there, you the wait best. a couple of days and you don't win the job. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You, if you do win the job, then, you know, obviously the pitch was in the right direction. But, yeah. you know, that comes back to kind of what we we're saying before about um, those two types of pitches is, you know, your EP should have communication with you and tell you, you know, these are one of the jobs that you should inject yourself into and make your own style. And then there's yeah. those other jobs where you play it safe and you give the agency what you want or what right. they want. Sorry. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you just, you know, and, and from what my understanding is you, you always have to have, I guess, um, your three best case studies always available and yeah, not so real. Yeah, when I say real, what a real really means in the industry is three pieces that are appropriate to the job that you're pitching on. Okay. So it's it's not a compilation of you know a bunch of jobs put together. It's um, if you're pitching on a car job, you want to put forward three pieces of your material that are closest represented to a car job and full productions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not just so, like highlights. Yeah, yeah. No. It could be, it could be spec stuff. It right. could be previous jobs that you've done. If you are pitching on a car commercial, for example, yeah. you know you want to showcase car pieces. You know, yeah. if you're showcasing or doing a a farming brand, mm-hmm. you know you want lifestyle stuff, or you you know you want you know something that matches that vibe. So, you know? so what kind of like? I, I I mean, I obviously think you have a style mm-hmm. based on the work I've seen on your Instagram. Mm. and your Vimeo, are, do you find that you're attracting certain types of jobs or certain types of brands, or is it, is it, does it fluctuate? Like, what are the variables involved with, like, okay, this is a Mike Ray uh, pitch? Um, I mean, me personally speaking, I like the idea of, um, like, not pigeonholing myself and being able to work with all types of brands. Yeah. But... Um, you know, every time I go for a meeting with an EP, they always ask me that question. I think everyone asks that question is, what's your style? And I think it's, me personally, it's come down to just visual storytelling. Yeah. Because um, you yeah. worked with a variety of, like, you, you did the uh, what, the Gay Lee mm-hmm. stuff in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Canadian Tire, obviously. The, the Farm. farm Robert's Blue Farm. Jays. Robert's so farm, it's like yeah. the brands are, yeah. they're diverse. Yeah. But, yeah. The, but I think the vision is, pr- is kind of, it's it same has style. the high grade touch yeah. on it. Yeah, I agree. Which is cool. Yeah, yeah like I, I started in the sports realm. That's really what gravitated me towards filmmaking. Um, okay. Was I guess just that experience of, you know, sharing times and memories with friends and recording them. And then that, that kind of evolved into, uh, you know, telling stories. And then, mm-hmm. you know, once I started telling actual stories, it's, you know, curating your visual style on top of that and you know what's the look of these stories how do you tell them what do they look like and then um yeah ultimately i guess like it's hard to it's hard to pinpoint your style like you know it's 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 easier for people to see it from an outside perspective because it really is like a part of you and it's like you know asking someone your personality traits is <laughs> yeah, like somebody right. from an outside perspective can tell you how you interact and, yeah. and treat other people more than you can yourself. Right. Yeah, you're right. That's a good point. Yeah. 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 So mm-hmm. when, when it comes to like getting now uh, hiring into uh, a DP at that mm-hmm. high level, now I understand it's, it's probably a lot different. I, it's probably not, you're not mm-hmm. hiring the person who's just DMing you and saying, Hey, check me out. Like mm-hmm. I would love to do your next Canadian tire spec yeah. or whatever it is. Um, what's the process in terms of hiring DP? Cause I understand that like, obviously the, the, like I said, the client needs to look out for themselves. So their mm. risk management DP is going to have to be established at a certain point. Are you, how much power and how much leverage do you have to be like, no, I want my buddy to do this. I mean, you'd like to think as a director that you have a hundred percent of the say, but the reality <laughs> is that you don't. Yeah. Interesting. Um, like I said, there is a vetting process for, 
for the agency, but it really depends on the job. You know, there's some jobs where, you know, you just come forward with your DP and they don't ask questions and you get wow. that opportunity to just choose who you want. But um, it depends on the size of the job, depends on, you know, the style of the job and, you know, what it needs to look like. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of factors that come into it, but um, I guess back to what you're saying about uh, the relationship with like a TP yeah. is director and DP relationships are the closest thing to dating. Yeah. So we talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like a marriage. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You and your DP are dating and in that dating process, you know, think you're going out with someone. There's always like a three date kind of like rule, right? <laughs> got my great dating date. advice. <laughs> yeah. So your first date, <laughs> you go out, you have some drinks, maybe you go for a walk, right? right? You get to know someone, yeah. you don't know them. Yeah. You sure. know, your second date, maybe you go in for the kiss, yeah. right? You're getting to know them a little bit more. Yeah. And then, you know, third date, maybe something else happens. We won't talk about what it is, spicy, but yeah, yeah. yeah. This is, but, this is a, this, I think this is a good rule. For, yeah, this is a, like this is a good a golden rule. Yeah. <laughs> the three date rule. Yeah. So, you know, when you're talking about working with a DP, That's, you know, let's say someone DMs you and you want to go for drinks, you know, you figure out if you like that person, if you, if you, you know, have a good time sitting there. You don't even have to talk about work. Yeah. You just sit there. You as people. Yeah. Yeah. As people. Yeah. Yeah. You sit there as people. You know, second date. You know, maybe you bring up and you start talking about work, you know, you yeah. go in for that kiss and you kind of feel each other out, how they work, whatever. And then, you know, third date is maybe you guys work together. Right. Yeah. 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 That's nice. very interesting. Yeah. I love that, actually. That's sick. Yeah. 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 I mean, <clears throat> nobody wants to work with people that they don't know. I mean, it does happen in in the industry, you know, on larger scale jobs. You, you'll bring someone in or bring, fly someone in. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, like... I've personally never worked with anyone that I'm not friends with. Right. And I think that's curated as a choice as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I want to have fun. I love what I do and I want to sit down with someone and yeah. enjoy that experience together and make good shit at the it's end also of the like day. Also, if they're like your friend or if like mm -hmm. you're close like that, then you can, mm -hmm. there's like a level of different trust and communication you can have with them where like you're not yeah. afraid to like maybe, um, like, I guess, um, like, Maybe not argue, but like battle with ideas. Like maybe yeah, this is yeah. the idea. Or maybe this Bounce is like, ideas back yeah, and forth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, it comes down to chemistry, right? Like that. Yeah. You know, it comes back to that idea of dating. You want to date someone that you don't have chemistry with. Yeah, you, know? so you want, you you want to date someone, someone who you should be honest. I've been there. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like yeah. you want to be honest, and, and as yeah. a DP myself, like working mm -hmm. with Anthony, you know, like I'm able to be honest with them. Whereas yeah. other directors, I might be like, if I say this, is going to piss them off. Is that going to make them feel yeah. like yeah. Yeah. I'm going to step on their shoes? Like I don't want to yeah. not to be extra nice it's kinda, about it's it. About the dating, it's like sometimes dating, your, like if you've been friends with someone for a bit and then you mm -hmm. date them later. Yeah. I've, I've done that once. Mm -hmm. It's pretty, it's, it's, it's enjoyable because you have a different dynamic built yeah. up yeah. as opposed to like, maybe like, let's say you go with like an extremely hot person. Yeah. So the DP has like amazing work. Mm -hmm. Then you meet them, they have no personality. Yeah. yeah, that so just yeah. kills it. It's like, yeah, yeah it so really it's does like, kill You don't want to go on a second yeah. date with this girl, you know, or whatever it is. So. Yeah. yeah, it's true. Um, yeah, communication. So you're saying, like, you know, offending your DP or not being on the same page. Yeah. You know, like, I feel like you should be able to look over at each other and, yeah. you know, you kind of see that look in the eye, like, yeah, you kind of like agree. There's just like that, yeah. you know, that built chemistry. But, like, I've, I'm able to look over at the DPs that I work with. And basically say like like this looks like shit. Like how can we make it look better? Yeah, yeah. and vice yeah, versa. Yeah. yeah, you know, DP you looks at me and honest. says like, why why are we doing it this way? Like, what's the purpose of this? And yeah. I'm just kind of like, you know, what? I don't fucking know. Like, you're right. Like, <laughs> yeah. we should change. This. You challenge each other a little bit. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. What's like, yeah. um, I'm interested in like like treatment development process mm -hmm. in terms of like, let's say you're you're on the short list, like you're one of the three directors pitching on this job. Mm -hmm. What's like the timeline typically from like, you got to, okay, you get the approval to pitch, developing mm -hmm. the treatment and then going to the meeting. Like what's the typical timeline look like? I would say typically it's probably like a week turnaround. Yeah. So between getting shortlisted, um, you know, sourcing your images mm -hmm. and then, uh, well, writing first and then sourcing your in images. Um, but depending on the budget, if it is a bigger budget, you'll have somebody sourcing there for you and a graphic designer to put the treatment together. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. So um, that's 
something to look forward to, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's cool. I bet that, that's yeah. a lot of the legwork is like yeah. some of the technical things and like all mm-hmm. this kind of monotony that mm-hmm. other creatives can like inject into and then you can just yeah. focus on purely the story. Exactly, right? Yeah, it's uh, like I've worked with a graphic designer or a, a sourcer a few times and mm-hmm. to be able to sit down and only think about the copy and think about you know the story you're telling and letting them bring extra ideas to the table and kind of inspire the images as well Mm -hmm. um you know when i'm pulling images i only you know i know a couple sites that i always go to kind of deal but the resources that they have are so much more significant yeah okay that they can actually bring you ideas after you've written your narrative and all your creative now do you ever like is there like a blend where you're like okay here are some references that i like and you send it Mm -hmm. to the uh, yeah. to the team and the designer and then yeah so build. the designer usually you'll send them a couple of references just to build off of mm-hmm. um things that you have access to and then they can build off of that um and then obviously there's an approval process between you as the director and and uh the graphic designer right you have to go through and approve kind of all the images that you're using and make sure mm-hmm. it's all tailored to the vision that you had i guess and are these people that you bring on mm-hmm. or are they Part of like a production company helps out with this or yeah that's usually something the production company will handle okay. um you know they want to win the bid as badly as you do right of course, yeah. um you know ultimately it's up to you to win it but they're going to give you the resources a good production company is going to give you the resources to you know succeed make things yeah right as good as possible when you first yeah. started were you like did you have like your own treatments like templates you're working with or how did you kind of um, go about developing treatments when you first kind of got off of the production company? Yeah, I mean, in terms of template, I don't know if that would be like the best route to go because you could find yourself in in a situation where, let's say, you're not winning jobs or something and it might be because of the layout or something yeah. that you have, right? Interesting. Um, like I tend to approach each treatment. Um, uniquely, like it's yeah, something. uniquely. Um but I guess like in terms of like dialogue and copy and text is usually it's the same things on like every treatment, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, you want to, you know, start with like, if you do have a twist on the concept, you want to start by explaining that your introduction, then you want to speak to the narrative a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and then obviously you want to break down the visuals, the audio, you know, every single piece, the casting, the location. Yeah. Every single piece of the commercial needs to be in that treatment. And, you know, sometimes we've even even gone as far as, as boarding and mm-hmm. putting putting temp boards into a treatment. Wow. Um, Get a sense of the flow of the storyline and things like that. Yeah, I mean, and mm-hmm. showing them exactly what they're seeing and telling them that you know exactly what you're doing is is sometimes key to winning winning a pitch. Yeah, something like I've been experimenting with, which I'm not, I'm not sold on it yet. Is like creating like a mood video to accompany the treatment, mm-hmm. so it gives a sense of like okay, this is maybe some of the tone, some of the it kind of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I feel like it does help people who aren't maybe as like visually inclined or maybe can't fully string something together based on like just pictures or a board. Mm-hmm. They can kind of get a sense of like okay, this is the world of this like for this spot or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I f- I find it can also <clears throat> potentially restrict you in some ways if they're like expecting this level or like this is the image you were getting yeah i mean in some scenarios that could bite you um yeah you know when it comes down to music and other things using that in like a rip or uh you know a spec cut yeah um you know sometimes agency gets too tied to that and then you end up yeah you know fighting for your life to tell them that you can't right. afford it <laughs> yeah uh, exactly yeah. so there is scenarios where that could bite you but um, I mean, generally speaking, I think on like the like top tier commercials, you would almost make like mood film, so to speak, okay. for like every job. Okay. Um, I mean, it's good practice for the uh, for the director, right? Because you know how long each take has to be. You know the performances. You know how each camera move is going to yeah. come together. You're more structured. Yeah. 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 And yeah. I have this theory that um, you shouldn't be able to call yourself a director unless you've been an editor. Because you totally you need that, to yeah. be able to yes. feel the cuts. You need to know how long each take should be. Yeah, you know you don't want to be wasting time on set. So it's a very valuable tool to be able to cut before you you know start directing. Totally yeah. agree. Or in a lot of people cut and direct. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. 
Do you um, still like you know you did editing a lot when you first started? Do you still edit on your own or? Yeah, I d- like I definitely still edit, not as much as I used to. Um, but I guess from like an outside perspective, a lot of those people I was editing for in those companies um, saw that I guess I took a bit of a, a, a path change in in my career, and they just stopped reaching out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It I sets mean, the evolution, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about your latest project, mm-hmm. the entire project, which mm-hmm. was um, amazing. And, and the fact that you were mm-hmm. able to do such a style mm-hmm. with Canadian Tire, no. which is total opposite of their normal aesthetic. Mm-hmm. How did you pull that off? That's also a great question. I mean, that, <laughs> that, that conversation with the agency was a, a bit of a weird one because we started off with a one-day shoot and a you know, certain budget. And then... Um, you know, a couple of directors pitched on it and I guess I gravitated towards my treatment, which, um, you know, I kind of got the green light from my EP to, you know, push them a little bit into, into a certain direction. And, uh, I guess they ended up really liking it. So they approached us again and they, they said they wanted to give us more money and extend to two days, wow. which was awesome. Yeah. So, wow. um, essentially that second day was a free for all for me. So, so they gave it to you for like that day was for you more or less. Yeah. Yeah. This is the first time I've done this as well, but getting into the edit, we, we showcased the client and the DC cut in the first screening to the client. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, so yeah, we, we kind of A and B them together instead of, you know, going forward, giving them their client cut. And then a month later coming out with the DC, right. Um, we were able to A and B things back and forth. Hmm. and ultimately pull pieces from the DC into the client cut. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously the client cut didn't turn out exactly like the DC, but it did have a couple cooler elements, which I was pretty stoked on. But yeah, I think DCs are important. Um, you have to, that's how you get your style out of things, right? And you, you have to fight even if it's just for a couple shots. Yeah. So you would know? you use your DC or would you use the client cut in your pitches? Uh, I think it depends on what you're pitching on. I see. Yeah. Um, Canadian Tire, for example, obviously, you know, we stripped the VO. We added in a bunch of kind of textural elements. Um, But depends on, I guess, the client's, like, brand, right? You know, how strict are they to their brand? And how lenient do you think the agency is going to be pitching to them? You know, and a lot of the time, you know, you will pitch the DC and that's what wins you the job. Yeah. And then the job ends up being completely being, stripped back. Yeah, what they want yeah, okay. yeah. at the end. Yeah. Right. But a lot of the times that cooler thing is what gets you the job. Interesting. Yeah. Um, to go back to like directing and just mm-hmm. talking about the the whole art of directing. Mm-hmm. Um, I know there's different styles of directors. I would love to know like in terms of like your onset style. Are you the type of person who is very like... I have my vision and I need it to be followed to a T or would you say that you're a little bit more flexible and you're very open to like what your DP has to say or what other people might have to say? To be honest, I don't think any of those questions should happen on set to begin with. Mm -hmm. It should be conversations that happened before pre-production. Exactly. Um, But I think also like it comes down to the DP choice as well. Right. Right. You know, you should be working with that DP that should already be on the same page as you. Yeah. Um, in terms of ideas and other things on set, like, yeah, like, you know, you want to throw an extra something in the back or, you know, try something like 100%. Why yeah. not? You know? Yeah. I don't have the answers for, you know. You're not married to every single frame. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. I mean, you are, but you're hiring people and bringing them on set to do their job. Right. They're good at what they do, and you need to hear that out, right? Yeah. Everyone's there for a reason, and you have to trust that. And if you're not bringing people in that you trust, then, you know, you, I guess that's when directors or people, they they f- they feel like they have too much control or that everyone else is wrong kind of deal. And it's right. you're not bringing the right people on set if that's the case. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So how would you, you know, kind of, dictate whether or not you did your job as a director like how do you at the end of the day you know as a director sometimes you might feel like i don't Mm. know if i did a good job Mm. like what dictates to you that you did a good job and what would dictate to you to say that maybe you had a bad day 
Uh, well, I mean, to start, there's obviously the personal presence of things, right? Yeah. You know, you want to work with people, like I said, that you want to have fun with. And treat everyone like you would want to be treated on set to begin with. Yeah. You know, if everyone's happy leaving, that's a good sign, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, you want client and agency to be the happiest. But yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of crew and other people, right? Like, it, it really comes down to, like, pre-production, like I said, you know? How smooth the day goes, how well it's planned. And that comes down to keeping people happy. A lot of the time, crew is unhappy because things weren't planned properly. You know, yeah, you're always. guessing things and you're making decisions you're on the day. everybody. Exactly. Right. That's yeah. when things get cascaded, right? Yeah. You're at the top and you need to know, you know, the answers to things. Right. And that's going to trickle down to the crew. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You're making so much more work for someone that's PAing or doing other things that has to re-rig stuff because you didn't plan it properly. Yeah. Hmm. Even on our spec that we shot uh, last month, we kind of knew going into it, it was an ambitious day. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried to plan it as much as possible. But on the on the day we were running behind, we are like, okay, we have to make a decision. What what shots can we eliminate yeah. to make the day and make sure that we don't like go extremely over time for everyone? Mm -hmm. um, and I think we couldn't have done that without the like the planning that was like weeks and weeks 100%. beforehand. Yeah. yeah. So and the so, conversations and, for, and yeah, like yeah. endless meetings and like yeah. four mm -hmm. hours on the on the location scout and whatever. And yeah, as someone who's like I'm just getting into directing. I just for my own peace of mind, I need to be like completely planned and everything needs to be like to a T before. Yeah. We get on set because otherwise, you know, too many things could happen that could go wrong. Yeah, and it could, it'll like just trickle down to every single person, and mm. it's not a good look. It's not a it's not a good process, obviously. Yeah, I almost feel like if you look at your crew at the end of the day and you can see their morale, mm -hmm. kind of dictates how good of a job you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, they're, as, as they're defeated and slugging. Yeah, yeah they're <laughs> defeated and they're angry. Then you're like, yeah. ah, it's probably just something wrong, or I didn't yeah. plan yeah, this right. The last thing yeah. you want, and but you need the self awareness, I guess, to like know, like, okay. Where, what mistakes did I make? Because there are some directors, and we've met them that it's it's like they don't even they don't they're not like in tune with I guess the feelings of the crew and like mm -hmm. what they're it's just like this is my vision. They're in their own world. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I guess if you crew like coming up, you know what that experience is, so you kind of know like yeah what's uh, tolerable. And what yeah, you can put yourself in the other position. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a fun question I want to ask. Uh, mm -hmm. If there's any other technical mm -hmm. questions you want to ask. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the fun one. <laughs> All right, let's ask the fun one. This is something mm -hmm. that me and Anthony have been talking about. And mm -hmm. somebody who is working on higher level stuff, I would love to mm -hmm. see how this affects your part of the I industry. The question is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you already know what it is. No, I don't. Mm -hmm. AI. I like yeah. AI. Okay. The advancement of AI and the way mm -hmm. that things have been going, I would love to get your perspective on it and how you think it affects your level of the industry right now. Well... I mean, from a directing sense, like AI doesn't have the capability to understand and create emotions. So, you know, I think we're safe for quite a while. Yeah. Um, it's a useful tool. I've used it on treatments. And, you know, when you say you've used it on a treatment, it's you're not letting the AI write your entire treatment. You're not you're, chat GBT writing it's a just story. A support. It's like a graphic designer. Like it's kind of just it's a, like an a, image an sourcer. Yeah. Right. It's someone that can help you. You know, regurgitate words and yeah. and and reword them, or or you know, you could you could prompt and it could inspire you in certain ways as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I like I know tons of buddies that use it for uh, mid journey for creating, yeah. you know, images right. for treatments and other things. Yeah, but cool. um, yeah, I mean, like at the end of the day, we're telling stories and we're communicating emotion, right? So. It's going to be a long time before it's capable of anything close to that. Yeah, because I think AI, obviously AI is pretty much, mm -hmm. it's an algorithm-based system. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. creating off of what already exists. It can't create something new, yeah. right? So anything that mm -hmm. it regurgitates is coming from something that's already been created by a human somewhere in the world. Yeah, And then it mixes it all together. But the thing with AI, and I guess where right now we can say we're safe for now, we don't know mm -hmm. technological advancements that can happen in the next decade, but... Like it doesn't, it can't tell right from wrong. So it can't tell good from bad. So it can't yeah. tell that Mike Ray stuff is good and, you know, Danny mm -hmm. stuff is shit. Like mm -hmm. it can't tell the difference. It doesn't know what's right from wrong. Yeah. And you still need a human in that to, yeah. you know. It's about the feeling you get when you watch something, right? Yeah. yeah. It can't yeah. create a feeling yeah. in a lot of ways. It'll just put things together. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but then there's a the classic, like, to be the devil's advocate, there's always like everything's been created already. So if mm -hmm. this has access to this pool of never, like, whatever has been made ever, mm -hmm. it could probably make something that's 80%. You know what I mean? I, I would yeah. assume. 
Which but, is probably what they like right now. I was an AI commercial that you that we, that we, yeah, yeah. What I would assume like what will happen is like they create a concept through AI that is algorithm algorithm says this will be viral or mm. this will go well, and then they'll be like, hey Mike, can you just readjust this and like yeah, you know yeah, but I mean like else. you know. Tell me how many Batmans have been made, and Christopher Nolan's was the best. You yeah, know? right. That's well, true. Yeah. Why is his better, right? That's yeah. Because that's, that's he put really his own point. feeling, his own touch on it, right? Yeah. That's true. You that's know, really that's all point. regurgitated. It's it's the same story. It's the same movie. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's, that's a true. really good point. I, I like that. That's, yeah. a, that's actually a really good, uh, I think, kind yeah. of argument. Yeah. 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 No, that's good. That's yeah. interesting. So, um, uh, a question I have in terms of directing, because this mm. is like, this is probably the most. Um, challenging aspect of the of the role that i think i'll be experiencing mm. and i know commercials are a bit different but working with like actors and talent and like pulling emotions from them and like the, mm-hmm. do you have a style i know it's commercials you have a bit more flexibility in terms of performance but um do you have like a certain um a way to communicate with like talent and actors to kind of get them to where you need them to be or do you think um about- no i think it's about making a connection with them mm-hmm. um in advance where you're, you're on a level of communication where you can have that transparency. Yeah. Um, there's not like secret code or secret like words to use when you're directing <laughs> okay, people. Yeah. I think it just comes down to like your connection with them and they can get you. Yeah. Your connection with them and making sure that, I mean, you have to hear them out too, right? Yeah. Um, and they're professionals. They, they know what they're doing. Yeah. Ideally, they're creating so. empathy. Exactly. Between the two of you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, each person is like different to work with, right? It's, it yeah. comes back down to relationships. It's, yeah. you know, every person that you've ever gone on a date with, the communication has been different. You know, each yeah. person is different and how you communicate to them should be different as well. Yeah. So that's I think true. that's the same as, you know, working with actors, obviously wording things in a way that they understand. Everybody learns differently. Everybody communicates differently. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that kind of comes back to the education system that we were talking about is, you know, schools have a formula for teaching people and that's just not the case not right. everybody learns the same way right not everybody you know absorbs information the same way so yeah it's about catering that communication to who you're talking to i think yeah i want to i want to go back to something you said earlier because it just crossed my mind again you did say mm-hmm. that you talked about being repped is not mm-hmm. like you i will i don't know if these are the right words but this is mm-hmm. not a big deal meaning mm-hmm. a lot of people think they've made it once they've got repped yeah so, like, I think a lot of people out there listening to this who aren't who aren't even close to being repped are probably sitting there thinking, "I thought that was, you know, mm-hmm. where I want to be." Mm-hmm. What What about it? Like, what's the advantages of being repped, and like, what does it mean to be repped? I mean, I think just the idea of like a rep or representation is that like the work is over and someone's there to do it for you, and that's right. just not the case. Um, and yeah, the job's just not over, you know, someone's not going to sit there. You can't throw your feet up on the table yeah. and have jobs come into you. You know, you, you still got to work for it you got to put the time in and, you know, something that I've done with my EPs is set up a bi-weekly meeting. So every nice. two weeks we sit down, we go over the boards that have come in, the nice. boards that, you know, I could have been pitched on or the boards that I, I was pitched on and and I've also even, you know, I've, I've asked my EPs before to send me every board that was sent to them for the month. Not because oh, cool. I'm selfish and I want to see what I should have been on, but because I can go through and I can read all these different types of boards from different agencies and learn how they're communicating yeah. and translate that into my pitching style. That's Which, really right. So it's like Smart. staying active. Yeah. Like you're just staying proactive the entire time. Yeah. What are agencies looking for? How do they want to be communicated to? Yeah. What's going to win you the pitch? The best yeah. way to do that is to, you know, kind of study what they're offering. Like exactly. How they talk. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. And mm-hmm. so I guess there's still that chance of like a lot of, like you talked about how once you're repped, if you just put, kick your feet up on a table, like you haven't, it's not over. No. Like you, you can still fail a lot yeah. of ways. It makes sense because there's so many production companies, there's so many directors, so many DPs, whatever it is. So yeah. you yeah. gotta be, you gotta be moving, I guess. It's extremely oversaturated right now. Yeah. yeah. Right. I guess that's the importance of like being creative and like having taking your own that voice. Risk. Yeah. yeah. Having your own voice that you yeah. talked about. I guess like I can't speak for other people. It's, yeah. it's definitely, I think a, a harder path um, to like, you know, etch your own style. Yeah. But 
once it is developed, then you're you're sought out for to communicate that style and not to be a delivery man to someone else's concept or creative. Fascinating. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So something I'm curious about is um, like what your life is like as a director, like your mm. full time director. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah. We kind of talked about it when we first met. Mm-hmm. Uh, like the number of jobs you work on per year kind of on average and like something I'm realizing because I was coming from like nonstop freelance shoot, almost shooting every day and then editing mm-hmm. and then um, I feel like as a director having that time to like also just experience the world and like mm-hmm. interpret the world and like digest it yeah. is important. Mm-hmm. Um, like how do you do you structure like your days? Like how many jobs do you usually work on like a year kind of thing? Yeah, I mean if we broke it down to numbers, I would say... Like if they're full rate jobs, you'd probably hope to get like, like I don't know, I can't speak for other people. Like a good year would be like six to eight jobs. Like that would, yeah. you know, yeah, that'd be very very comfortable living. Um, you know, in that time in between those, you're you're working on networking, meeting agency people, um, talking to EPs. Um, you know, in my case, meeting with other DPs as well, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, everybody's friendly. Everybody wants to, you know, chat. And that's one of the beautiful things about this in- industry yeah. is, you know, everybody's there to make cool things. And yeah. regardless if you're going to work together, you still get to have that conversation and learn things that you didn't know before. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in terms of time, like, um, you know, let's say you land a job, you'll do a week or two of pre-production, hopefully. And, uh, <laughs> You know, then you'll shoot for two days. Then you'll have two weeks of post, three weeks of post, let's say. Mm-hmm. Um, so that takes up like a month. Um, then usually, like me personally, I'll have like, I don't know, a down month or something where I cruise around networking. And I just bought a sailboat. So oh, sick. Yeah, I saw that in your story. So maybe I'll uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> do, <laughs> spend, the, spend the month on the sailboat. We'll see. <laughs> That's um, pretty cool. Yeah. Where's the sailboat parked? Uh, Sunnyside Beach, if you know that. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a marina just beside it. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. So do you find that you need, like, work-life balance is, is a very popular niche that people like to talk about. Mm-hmm. Would you say, you know, like, that that's important that you kind of disconnect yourself from this? Or do you are you the type who just needs to constantly somewhat stay connected? And you're, if you're not working, yeah. you're networking and you're coming with an idea. Yeah, you know, I, I personally like disconnecting in between a little bit. Yeah. Um. You know, when I'm on, I'm on. Yeah. But I think it's important to enjoy yourself in those in between times. Yeah. Um, it is extremely stressful as a director to have this schedule where you get a job and you work for like, you know, a couple of weeks and then you're down for a month or two. Um, you know, it can really get to your head, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you think you're never gonna work again and then <laughs> and then the job lands. You know? Yeah. So it is definitely a stressful lifestyle and something that you have to kind of um get used to right but um yeah you had to remember that like you have a talent in a portfolio and it's something that people can't take away from you so it's always going to be there and you have to kind of trust in that work and just find the opportunities that's pretty cool Mm -hmm. and so what do you think uh are like the next like i mean this is hard to project but Mm -hmm. like what's next for like next stage of your career let's say i know you were talking about like you're you're in this in new york for uh Mm-hmm. For a few things and talking about projects down there and how the, the yeah. budgets are kind of completely different. Yeah, what do you where do you see yourself kind of going like from here? Um, like I said, like just continuing to make things that you're passionate about and then expanding your pool, I guess. Um, so big stage for a lot of people is obviously having those conversations in the states. Um, you know, you could look at Europe. Um, there's there's opportunities everywhere, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you could be winning jobs in Canada, but you know, there's twice, three times as big of a pool in the states. Um, so why not start those conversations? Why not? Right. Even if it's on a personal basis, you know, I went down yeah. there and talked to a couple of production companies and um, chatted a bit about work, but it was mostly introductions and um, you know, just feeling out that side of the pond, I guess. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. Fascinating. So mm-hmm. one question we like to cap off with all the mm-hmm. time is just your advice to people who want to do what you do. Uh, what kind of advice do you have for the young bucks? Um, 
I mean, don't be afraid to be told no, I guess. Um, it's a good thing to be told no. Hmm. And uh, yeah, just prove people are wrong. Yeah. You find no is like your motivator? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's nice when people say no because it gives you something to work towards. To I feel the same way. Yeah. It's like a, it's like, I guess through. it's the sports side yeah. of you, right? Because I yeah. grew up in sports as well, and it's the competitive nature mm. of like yeah. you hear you can't do it, and you're like, okay, yeah, I'm yeah. Sure and if you, you fail school, it's not over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, definitely not over. Yeah, Just yeah. The beginning. I, uh, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Cool. Yeah. Uh, well, we really appreciate you coming, man. Yeah. Lots of valuable information. I look forward to whatever projects you have coming up. Do you have projects coming up that uh, you're allowed to share? Um, a couple boards floating around, but we'll see yes. what happens in the next month or two. Yeah, yeah cool. Yeah. yeah, and if you know people are watching, definitely check out the work. I mean, it's mm. it's it's next level work, as they will call it. You know, Thank next you. level. So, um, yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks, Appreciate man. you guys uh, having me on. Yeah, we'll, uh, yeah sure. We'll chat soon. Mm -hmm. All right. Boom. Boom. Yeah. Cut. Right.